these are my friends. Come along with me. See how the story ends. It's the going rate, baby. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Professional Hippies. We're your host, Colton, Dylan. Professionals, most of the week. Hippies, all of the week. Hey, if you're new to our show, we like to bridge the gap between professionals and the hippie woo-woo. Whatever that means to you, we like to meet you somewhere in the meaty middle. Today's episode is brought to you by North Spore. Once again, if you are an aspiring mycologist or someone that just wants to be a fun guy, head on over to North Spore. They have all the resources you could ever want on educating yourself from growing, um, let's say, oyster mushrooms. Those are delicious. Lion's mane, good for you. Uh, You can use the discount code linked in the show notes and you will get 10% off. Not only does it help support you and hopefully a flourishing endeavor, but it supports us. And if you like our content, be sure to follow along. If you listen to the end of the episode, give it a rating so we know you like it. Mm. Did I miss anything? Sounds no. good. Looks I good. I think that was good. Looking even better. I think we should all I think we should all have mushroom growing in our yards and then we start our own. Everyone has their own medicinal medicinal Pharmacy, right the in the way backyard. litigation's going, it seems like that's the tide of America. Is like the You're war like, on oh. drugs is over. Let's just all of a sudden pretend like we've never done any of this stuff. You're like, my stomach's upset me. Oh, I got some turkey tail in the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nope. num, 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 num. I've no, seen uh, those like log growing kits. Have you seen those where you drill yeah. drill holes on the logs and you can just have your mushrooms growing out back and stuff? I think those are they, pretty they, cool. It's seen, they make it look so easy, but from what I've heard from like you and others that have been growing, it could be quite difficult well, to get a good batch Different going. kinds of mushrooms are different kinds of difficult. So yeah. the turkey tail is actually pretty straightforward. You uh, drill a hole and they give you these little pegs that you put in there and you just push the peg in there and you cover it with beeswax. Hmm. And then uh, I guess about a year later, six months later, they'll kind of do their thing and eat into that wood. But if you want to see God, it's a little tricky, I guess. Can be, yes. A little bit, yeah. yeah. Little bit. He make, he doesn't make it easy. He's like, I ah, gotta go through you a few hunt things for it. to get you here. <laughs> Will it kill you? you? Work for Will it, it lighten you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> These look the same, but different. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> there's um, there's been a ton of rain in Texas lately. So this is like going through. Now this is our second season here. Last year, it just was ungodly hot. It rained, I think, yeah. three times in like three months. And we've been getting all the rain. So it's beautiful. The landscape is like full of these wildflowers. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is because I really wanted to go on those like little mycology, you know, the meetups where Ooh. all the fun fungi people get together and they're like, just super stoked to share their hobby with other people. Mm -hmm. So you just get together and go hunt for mushrooms. And uh, from most of the people I've met that are really into mushrooms, a lot of them really aren't like what you would think is like just hunting for trippy mushrooms. They're out there getting like these fluff balls, which are apparently really good and kind of jerky like Mm -hmm. when you cook them up or turkey tail and some of the other ones that are like really common. But they're, they're out there just having a field day, just tapping them. They'll tap them so they drop the spores, and they have these little b- mm. mesh bags that they put their mushrooms in. So as they're walking along, it's dropping spores along the trails and stuff. That's, that's cool. It just seems like a fun thing to get into. Like, if you're a nerd out about something, it, it, that'd be a cool, cool little hobby to get into. Yeah, I can see that because there's so many different types of mushrooms out there. It'd kind of be fun. It's like finding a, a wild Pokemon. You know, you haven't, right. you know, and you're like, oh, that's a rare one. Especially if you one. eat one of the psychedelic ones, then I'm, then I would imagine that the other ones would look like Pokemon for sure. Yeah. It's like, oh, we're going to do a little adventure today. We're going to go, we're going to take the mushroom, then look for the mushrooms. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it'd just be a cool thing. Like if, um, we need to plan our next camping trip because that would be a blast. And I would totally love to go out on uh, one of those little field trips with these mycologists and imagine if we're out in the woods and we are 100% on some mushrooms and we cook them up at a campfire, Mm -hmm. like that'd be a sick experience. Catch some fish, cook up some mushrooms. Mm -hmm. That'd be awesome. I like going to, uh, that's why I like going on the Appalachian trail. 
because there's so many opportunities to come across mushrooms out there just along the trail when you're walking all the mm-hmm. creeks that come across there's so many different paths and shades that you can look at while you're there and they're just growing right out the side of the the hill that you're doing, walking along doing their great. mushroom thing you know doing it's mu- like backpackers aren't like actively looking for mushrooms when they're backpacking you know I, i've been pushing myself to like if you're coming across the log that may be like eye length and you just look inside the log not often but sometimes there's like a whole little world gro- of mushrooms growing inside that log dude it's wild the more you learn about them the more and i've grown to appreciate them because uh watching more of the paul Samet stuff following him uh, mm-hmm. He recently discovered his own psychedelic mushroom, got to name a psychedelic mushroom after Ooh. himself. So that was pretty neat. That's exciting. Um, but I guess on the development of species, mushrooms are closer to humans than plants mm-hmm. are. So however that works, like we're closer related to mushrooms than we than a mushroom is to a plant. Correct. You, when the DNA split, it happened closer to us than when it did with plants mm. when the split happened. And so that's kind of like with the port, you know, he'd stay, Sam Coast was talking about this a while back of the portobello mushroom. When you cook it up and eat it, a lot of people say it tastes like meat. He was like, that's just interesting. Were they also <laughs> saying that uh, the portobello has carcinogenic properties? It's if not it's not that, cooked properly. Yeah. yeah it'll it's release not the best for you. Stuff in, yeah, that causes cancer and all kinds of good stuff so it's that's just the mushroom fighting back it's like hey man what doesn't cause cancer these days eat enough of anything it's going to cause it you know it's like even if you eat organic produce like the way that they're farming organic stuff has it's just if you ate a hundred bananas a day something's gonna (laughs) something's gonna happen that's a lot of potassium 100 bananas a day you're for sure gonna have a problem yeah that's that's a problem (laughs) You're probably going to need a couple of evals mentally, yeah. physically. You know, probably. bananas used to be like a very royal thing to eat. It wasn't like anybody could just eat I them. It was pineapples. Like... Pineapples were uh, a fixture. That's why all the old wooden furniture had mm-hmm. pineapples in them. That was like the creme that de la creme. Because they, they, they expire so quickly. Mm-hmm. So it's just they take so. Have you ever seen them transporting, you know, bananas? from south america to here all the work it takes they have to have like surround it they have to put them in a chamber and surround them with like a special type of gas that's going to maintain their their uh i don't know what you would call it their ripeness yeah ripeness in order for them to reach the public marketplace <laughs> for me to buy well, the from. trippy thing about bananas is like how cheap they are yeah i mean at it's the same time too. i'm like how the hell are, how they growing this and getting it to the grocery store and it cost me like 60 cents yeah i just know when i eat them i'm like oh i'm royal you know i can eat these <laughs> things this is awesome it only tell cost me termites. 60 cents tell them termites be feeling about your house buddy that's They're right like, mm. i'm so <laughs> grateful we can at least tent while we're gone in vegas i don't have to do it while i'm here dude funny enough because you brought that up i got termites too oh dude <laughs> yeah termite buddies termite yeah, bros we're termite buddies we're termite buddies <laughs> Are they the, uh, are they the, what do they call it? The above ground or the underground? So you have uh, dry wood termites and you have subterranean termites. The difference yeah. is the subterranean ones like to create the mud tunnels. So you don't yeah. typically see, you'll notice them doing their mud tunnel stuff or uh, when they swarm. The dry yeah. ones are the ones that you'll see little flakes of stuff like mm-hmm. at your entryway or, you know, if uh, you're up in the attic and you just happen to, catching them doing their business or whatever. But um, I called, because when I lived in Tampa, I did my own stuff. I, I called a guy out, and he was just a small business owner. Dude just hooked me up, and he was like, yeah, normally I charge people for this, but since your referral, whatever. And then he called me back up one day. And he was like, hey, um, I know you really hate termites. And uh, just the nature of the conversation we had, he was coaching me up on how to do it myself, whatever. He was like, I have an extra... 300 chemical 300 gallons of this chemical do you want me to just dump it off at your house and just spray it you'll be good for like 20 years and i was like yeah yeah, yeah man sounds just good back that bitch right up to the front and just spray the mm-hmm. whole house down it's fine just dump it actually just pop top dump it out yeah so 
I'm still doing it myself on this house, <laughs> uh, but I found out because I was in the attic trying to get rid of uh, some rats that have just refused to die. I mean, they'll die up there, but they just refuse to not stop coming in to die. And yeah. uh, I, so I called it the do it your own people or whatever. And um, yeah, it's like crazy how expensive it is to get it done when you have professionals do it versus mm-hmm. doing it yourself. But when you, it sounds like you got a problem problem. If you mm-hmm. gotta tent the house, those things are probably uh yeah well they were swarming inside the house so usually when they're inside the house at, at that point it, it's in it's in your walls at that point so the guy yeah. thankfully the guy the, the exterminator guy who I have come out and check up on things he's like I've been checking this house for years even before you moved here so he goes you know good news is this is the first we've seen this so it's probably pretty minimal damage that they've done so we're catching it at a good time. But he goes, you're definitely going to have to tent the house to get in order to get rid of these guys, because that's the only way to do it. Because they're they're so seeped into everything. Like I went underneath the house, looked around, didn't see any signs. So that means they 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 want like the dry wood frame, I guess, or something. The frames of the house. So you're going to be messing assumption. up the termites while you're in Vegas getting messed up. Hell yeah, dude! I'm gonna be messing them up while I'm getting messed up. <laughs> dude, I'm fired up for Vegas, man. This is going to be a time and a half. I, are we, uh, have we decided are we recording a podcast while we're there? I think that'd be tough. We got, you know, we're going to, I think, 15, bu- 15 buddies there. I think that'd be tough to record anything. And every time we say we're going to record something, we never do. It always do. happens. It always, we <laughs> always find a way to get it done, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> we promise our listeners, it's going to be great. We're going to record out there. And <laughs> we let them down every time. <laughs> Right, folks. <laughs> we're consistent if anything <laughs> i mean it, we again we'd have to set up everything just so it's ready to go find a spot in the house to set it up in order to do it at yeah best best to plan ahead and you know if that's the the quality of content we're looking to put out i don't i mean we can record one before and then immediately when we get back nice yeah. little uh <laughs> you know, postdoc yeah because it, excitement we could, we could figure Sad. out a way we could find find a way to do that but uh we'll we'll be able to capture the journey regardless i'm stoked for that week and then the week after going to the psychedelic science conference um mm-hmm. I, I think we'll have some good stuff to return back to base and and debrief on so to speak but mm-hmm. um leading up to that it's been interesting kind of getting everything prepped um i wonder just, if you can pull any um like if you bring the podcast with equipment with you to the psychedelic thing, just to have it on hand and just see if you could pull anyone to be on like a quick 30 minute guest on the podcast. Well, the weird part is that like I originally booked my ticket for that conference to go just to learn. Like that mm-hmm. was it. That was the only reason I wanted to go. And I think I bought my ticket back in January uh, or February, something like that. So I, I had a startup that I was a part of for about three and a half, four months. And that didn't end up panning out. Joined another startup. That didn't end up panning out. And so I'm kind of at this crossroads where I'm like, am I going to use, am I going to continue to pursue psychedelic ventures and using my skill set to try and contribute to that space? Is there opportunities there that I can pursue? And I'm thinking so. So I'm kind of approaching it as like a networking thing, but also a learning thing. So there's probably not a lot of room for networking while podcasting because it's just a different yeah. hat that you're wearing. Yeah, you it makes sense. Like, hey, uh, here's my resume. Would you like to come on my podcast and talk about psychedelics? Just, just be that of... annoying ass guy with the microphone in everybody's face. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the guy that uh, interviews rappers um, that does like an immense amount of research? Oh, Nardwar. Oh, yeah. 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 I love Nardwar interviews. Have you he's, watched his interviews? Oh yeah, he's a legend yeah. in, in interviewing uh, a lot of people. <laughs> I've only seen like his clips and stuff, like the shock clips when when people are like, "Where?" Oh no, watch them. They're like hour long videos, hour long really? interviews that he does with them, and uh, just go on his page. You you know, pull up some of the more famous ones that like uh, uh, Tyler the Creator. Those that's like those are the some of the best ones. Or Tyler Creator because Tyler Creator loves. Nardwar and doing mm-hmm. interviews with him and and also fucks with him during yeah. it. But uh Nardwar uh oh, who's the guy with the show on Cartoon Network that does uh um just sketches, stupid sketches. Is it Andre? 
No. Oh, there's another guy like Andre, the white guy. I don't remember if it was a white guy. No, he's not a white guy. But anyway, see, like the people that usually do these dumb skits and fuck with people, Nardwar were interview him, and he <laughs> put he. You watch these people come down to being like, "Oh shit, I'm being fucked with, and I can't handle this right now." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his his interviews are pretty legendary. He used to give be given a lot of shit on uh, rappers back in the day because he does such immense research that. Um, he, he, I don't know how he does it. I think I've heard like he does go and call like their buddies and friends and family to like try to pull info. Yeah. And sometimes he would like rappers don't like to get to be known for a lot of, like certain things and he'll bring yeah. it up and they're like, what the fuck, dude? How I have do you know seen that? a couple of those where they're like, Hey man, like based on the piece of information that he gives, they're like, if you know that, then you can kind of see the chain going off in their head, and they're like, mm, you're poking around in some boxes I don't want people to know about kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, But now, I mean, he's pretty well respected now because of he, he gifts them a lot of stuff or whatever, but <laughs> I think I, they started respecting him more once they realized, like, I think they started respecting him more once they get interviewed by other people, and interviewers at most other of these, like, you know, magazines or whatever, probably get pretty annoying. It's probably the same thing every time. Whereas same question War is a over and over. Whole nother type of interview. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a whole nother world right there. Yeah, he kind of comes across as like a, a real curious soul, but at the same time, like uh, who was the guy that used to do parody songs of um, of like number one hit singles? Oh, uh why, why am I blanking on that? That one's a tough one. That, that's not even a tough one. That's an easy one. That should it's be an easy. easy one. Like, uh, they see me rolling. They hate to try to catch me riding white and dirty. What is that, dude? Um, oh, man, I'll just put it in one white and dirty. That'll be easy. The people that are, uh, that are listening to this are going to be screaming. And- <laughs> Weird Al. Weird Al. <laughs> He kind of gives me weird owl vibes. Like you, you're not like a little bit. You're like, are There's you a all movie there? Came, movie came out about Weird Al recently. Oh, really? It was uh, who was whoever the Harry Potter? Man, we are doing great. Whoever the Harry Potter actor's name is, <laughs> <laughs> that guy played Weird Al. <laughs> We're doing great today, <laughs> dude. I didn't take my vitamins. That's my problem. Yeah, it's end of the day here for me. Yeah, I went uh tried to knock out some disc golf. I've been getting really into Daniel disc golf. Radcliffe. I Daniel want to get Radcliffe. into it. Now that I got my uh knee surgery done, I'm coming back. I'm ready to get back into it. It's ready a, to golf some more. Get a really into fun disc sport golf. to get into, man. Yeah, there was I uh, I'm part of a group that does it pretty much every weekend. They go and do play a whole bunch of different ones in the area. Yeah, it's it's super fun cuz it's free. The way I look at it is like you know, not every time you go out, you're going to have like the best outing, but you can't really be mad because at least you're in nature. You're like, if anything, I'm just going and on a How many a things you walk. can do for free these days? You know, you just need to buy the Frisbees and go on out and do it. That's what I'm saying. If you pick up like regular golf, I mean, the barrier to entry technically isn't that high, but if you want to get really good at it, it gets expensive it's, quick. It gets ex- It gets expensive. If you want like good clubs and stuff, it's good. it's going to get expensive real quick. And then depending on your courses, man, golfing too, like even public courses now are like 30 to 50 bucks mm-hmm. just playing on some here in the area. And I'm like, man, that used to be like 15 bucks. You can go out on Saturday, hit the course, just have a good day. And now it's getting same price as what private courses are. And private courses are like $200. And to be frank, I don't know that I've ever played golf sober. I don't know that like one time I've gone out and uh, most of the time we don't finish because right around hole 14, 15, it's just. Oh, you got to finish. That's the, that's the best part is that back in. I think you know? I finished two games total. <laughs> <laughs> when the, when, when the edible and the Adderall mix a perfect combo, it's usually about hole 11. Well, that's what I'm saying. With disc golf, I go out <laughs> and it's just a bunch of hippies. I mean, like, if, oddly enough, really Christian people I'm noticing. I've run into a ton at the course, like whole youth groups and stuff. The other day I played with this uh, this guy and his wife, and they were um, teachers at a private Christian school. Mm-hmm. He was so good. He taught me a lot of stuff, and I was like, all right, this is perfect. 
I, I really realized I started to pick up on something when I said fuck about for the fourth, fifth time hitting a tree. And normally you just get like the echo of a fuck. Someone's like, yeah, fuck, that sucks. You know, yeah. like I feel for you. And uh, I just didn't get that reverberation. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, something's, something's off here. You know, let me dial in. And uh, yeah, figured out why. Figured but, out why. It's just a fun little sport. I almost, based on what he taught me, it's kind of like golf. If you aren't putting your hips into it, you're not hitting it very far. It's just all arm. And mm -hmm. he taught me how to put my hips into it. The first throw at the next course, I'm by myself. Uh, correction, Abby's with me because she really got a kick out of this. I threw it so hard, I almost threw my shoulder out of socket because it was just, <laughs> oh, no. I felt it come out and go back in and the disc went straight into a tree. And while I'm like bending over, wincing in pain, Abby's doubling over, uh, crying, laughing. And she was like, yeah, how's that, how's that working out for you? But past that, you know, once you get past the shoulder pain, I, I tried to go today and it started raining and I was like, eh, what are you going to do? You know? Yeah. Nature. I you went frisbee golfing dead. right before my knee surgery with some buddies and they were, <laughs> had to throw it over a lake one and I ended up, I didn't have any throwaway disc yet, right? I just got my disc. So this is a nice disc and I lost it in the lake. Straight in the center. It's a, it's a runoff straight in the center and it was a runoff <laughs> lake too. And they're like, oh, that sucks. And I was like, you, you bet I'm not going in that thing and getting that disc. I, <laughs> I went down to my underwear and I was like, I'm getting that fucking disc out of there. <laughs> Did you get it? I couldn't find it. It literally <laughs> like sunk. But along the way, I found two other discs. I bet you did. Yeah, I found two yeah, other discs under the swampiness. So, but I have two throwaway discs now. So the next time I have water, so I lost one nice disc, but I got two throwaway discs for the next time I'm in water. I I just felt like it was the cycle of of Dude, uh, disc golf. You thousand know? percent. That's what happens. I went to <laughs> when I I went to the gun range yesterday with a buddy and uh, got some. Good stuff to talk about there. But on the way out there, I was like, hey, I, I don't go to San Antonio a lot. Let me see if there's like pro shops. And I found one, had like awesome reviews. And I was like, I don't know that I've ever really been to a disc golf store uh, like this. And I went in there. No one else is in the shop. And I asked the guy, I was like, hey, man, I was hoping it wouldn't be busy. It's like two o'clock on a Tuesday. Um, can you just, I, I've been, he's like, how long have you been playing? I was like, I've been playing three, four years. That doesn't mean I'm good or I know anything. I brought all my discs. If you could just tell me what these mean, what they're supposed to do. Cause I don't like, I'm, I'm using a driver to putt. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know really what's going on here. And, um, he took me through everything. He was like, well, let me see, let me see you throw. And I was like, all right, this is a pretty vulnerable state to be in. You know, so I show him my throw and he was like, oh, no, no, man, you do it again. Do it this way. He keeps critiquing me. Like, finally, he gets up from around the desk. He comes over. He's like, no, get in the stance. I'm like, all right. And then he's like, grab my <laughs> shoulders. He's like, shoulders go this way. Knees go that way. Hips go this way. Do it again. And I'm like, God damn. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you get into this. <laughs> but um, the cool part was after all of that, I was like, all right, so what else should I buy? And he was like, you have everything you need, man. He's like, I'd love to sell you something, but this is after like 30 minutes of going through all my stuff with me. And I'm like, dude, I got to fucking buy something now. He's like, no, you're, you're good. I'm like, dude, I didn't drive all this. Like sell me something at Give least. Me a good one. Yeah. You know? So I ended up buying something just to support the shop, but, uh, um, tell me I, my game will get better. Even though it won't just give me a disc. <laughs> well, I sent you a video right before we got on the podcast because today when I went out there, I tried to do that new form and I threw mm. it smack dab. I mean, it, it maybe went five yards and I threw it straight into this thicket with all, what are they called? The tagalongs? Tagalongs, yeah. Yeah. It's little a type sticky of... fuckers. Yeah. Dude, yeah. eight. I've never in my life seen a bush so thick of them. <laughs> oh, no. My legs were covered. You could hardly see my skin. There were so many, and I tried to get a comb, I tried to get a fork, none of it would come out, so I had to take my Cutco knife, and I had mm -hmm. to shave them off of my legs. Oh, no. <laughs> I've never in my life. Dude, I, I've, those are the worst plant in the world. That's an evolution that could just die off. <laughs> yeah, bro. <laughs> Animals hate them. I'm sure other e plants hate everything them. Everything hate them, but that evolution was like, oh, no, we figured it out. Just drop whoever touches us. Just drop a seed on them. It's the OG Velcro. Yeah, which that's an evolution that doesn't, it relies 
on other living beings to make sure they spread. Mm-hmm. That's the only way it's spreading. If it drop, it, yeah, I guess it could drop, but it wants to go out somewhere else. So it wants you to drop the seed somewhere else. So it completely just relies on us being their little asshole. Well, you know, as we're saying, I'm fiddling with my shorts because I still have them in my shorts. And I can tell you, I dropped, I dropped you know about ninety nine percent of those fuckers in the parking lot. So I hope they do well in cement. You know what it takes to kill those suckers too. So I've got them kind of in my yard, right? I had an invasion of them last year and I had to kill them off because it was getting bad in my yard. And, uh, I looked it up. I had to get this this special chemical that'll only kill that and not my grass. And I had to get another special chemical that when you spray it, it'll stick to the plant. Right. And not like wash off or whatever. So it was like a combo of two things. You mix it up and you spray it on the plant. And then it takes four to six weeks to see if it works. <laughs> like, And it takes about after a week and a half, you'll start seeing it yellow and then you'll start seeing it die. Right. But if it doesn't fully work, you'll see the green starting to come out of it. And it has to, you have to spray the top of it for it to then get to the roots. Cause if you just pick it up, the roots up, it'll, there's still roots in the ground. And it'll just go come right back out. What a hardy little fucker. Yeah, that thing is, those plants are no joke. Four to six weeks for this, this chemical is specifically created to kill it. I'm like, God dang, it's like a pest, evolution. You know? Evolution did, did right on that plant. You know, like termites, tinted, dead, gone, done, you know, right? Call it in two or three days, four to six weeks to take out. I still haven't been able to wrap plant. my head around how the rats are getting in my attic. I got like this wire mesh stuff now. And this expandable foam that's meant for rodents because it's got some chemical in it. I had to climb on my roof, which I'm normally pretty comfortable on a roof, but the pitch of my roof is really concerning. So the other day, I had to hold on the underside of where one pitch meets another, put my foot on the pergola, and at this point, I'm completely upside down spraying this chemical, just praying that this chemical does not come back in my eyeballs. And that... I was like, man, I really, really, really hope these guys are trapped up there. Is your house made out of wood or or block? Uh, wood. Wood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So maybe they're burrowing in the ground and they're coming up through a chamber. If if what I've done now doesn't work, I'm gonna just hire a rodent dude. I mean, I've been all over forums. I've done everything I can. My AC lines, all the lines, all the stuff, and I just for the life of me have no idea because you know a little gas in each corner and a flame takes care of a lot of things i think that then we're <laughs> getting into insurance fraud is what it sounds like no one no no what? no one said anything about that <laughs> no come on now don't be that like that <laughs> well speaking of i did get a new gun yesterday <laughs> speaking of drawing a case what so what type of gun did you get? <laughs> My buddy's just letting me hang on to it for a while. I had a friend that wanted to get into hunting, and yeah. he'd never really done hunting, uh, but I do distinctly remember him saying he's an Eagle Scout. Um, and so I had some really fun stories to share from our camping trips about you being an Eagle Scout <laughs> stuff and all the trauma he's experienced because his dad was a scout leader, and um, he just absolutely hated it, but he did his Biggest. thing. His dad, he hated being a scout with his dad being a scout leader. His dad hated being a scout leader. <laughs> oh, no, definitely. It was all boyhood trauma for him. He was yeah. like, he wanted nothing to do. Like, I guess once that age where it gets awkward, because like you're in high school or you whatever. You got to push through it. Yeah, right. that's a tough, that's a tough time, which ironically is where some of your best stuff happens in scouts. Because now you can go do the big boy stuff of like yeah. super, like, you know, pretty dangerous things. That's when you can start going to do those things. Right. But now <laughs> you get, get made fun of a little bit in the school. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it, it makes no sense because it's like one of those things where if you play an instrument in high school, you're a fucking weirdo. But if you play an instrument as an adult, that's super dope. Like everybody wants to hear you play an instrument. You like roll up at a party with a guitar or something to contribute to the atmosphere. It's super cool. Um, yeah. Well, it's funny too because as you got as it, as you get older, let's say you're an Eagle Scout, and people are like, "Man, I want to go camping. I've, I've never been camping before." And I'm like, "Oh, you need this, this, and this." And they're like, "What? You know how to do all this?" I'm like, "I could 
you could drop me off somewhere and I can survive pretty well. (laughs) And they're like, what? And then they, and then a lot of people told me, man, I wish I would have learned that, you know, when I was younger, had the opportunity to learn it and be like, you did, you were just a fucking bully. (laughs) 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 And so like he wanted to get into just harvesting in his own, whatever you want to be a little bit more part of the system. And I'm like, okay, sweet. Well, He's like, do you know anything about guns? I was like, been raised around him my whole life for sure. So we went and um, it was a learning experience for me too because it's different when you're just around guns mm-hmm. and know how to handle them, shoot them well versus um, going through the whole process with someone new. Like that's when you you start to see blind spots in mastery. It's only until you have to explain it to somebody else. Mm-hmm. So um, we went and he got a brand new AR-10 and when we took it to the gun range, it sounds like a 50 cal going off. I mean, oh, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a semi-automatic, semi-automatic rifle, shoots a you know, pure, pretty, pure. pretty big round, shoots a 308 <laughs> round, and it's just like, claw, claw. and so, um, <laughs> pure, pure. Pew, pew. <laughs> getting into that, <laughs> my other buddies uh, going on a deployment, and um, I was asking for him for advice because he has uh, a couple ARs and, and things like that, or a couple of guns, and... He just let me borrow his AR-15 indefinitely. He was like, it doesn't get used. If you'll use it, awesome. It needs to, you know, guns need to be used. Mm -hmm. That's what they're meant for. So get after it. So uh, we went to the range yesterday and um, fired off a couple handguns. Cool. action, you know. Yeah, you got to use your gun, folks. If you have them, you can't just let them sit there. You got to keep them oiled, keep them maintained. You do Mm -hmm. have to shoot them because they do well way better if you keep them maintained after shooting you can't just let them sit in the closet <clears throat> so i hope a lot of people are going on their target because there's a lot of people over covid that just bought a gun and then haven't used it or target practice like go to a shoot straight spend 20 bucks at the range get you some bullets and mm-hmm. shoot down the range super easy any instructor will show you there how to do it they for free so fired up like, yeah go they'll do it for range, free they're they like, i don't fired know how to use this. up about guns it's it's kind of <laughs> more unnerving than anything when i just see how excited some of these people are about their guns i'm like yeah man you're you're really into this you know i'm just asking for some ammo and they're like oh that's a nice uh sig you got there i mean me personally i'm a, I'm a glock man <laughs> and you know i use this one for this and this one for that and me pappy's got that one and you know I'm, it's all right i guess you know if you're into that <laughs> I'm like, it's like, dude, I see you You know, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> and it's cool when you're teaching somebody how to shoot, too, because a gun is not meant to be babied. And like, if anything, it mm. responds better when you beat the shit out of it, right? Like, when you're loading it, you need to load it hard. When you're cocking it, you need to cock it hard. When you fire it, you definitely need to fire it hard, and you don't need to be timid. So, definitely cool not flaccid. Definitely not flaccid. Definitely not flaccid. <laughs> no. And if, it, if you ain't, if you are flaccid, you won't be afterwards. I'll tell you that, folks. There's something strangely relieving about shooting a weapon. Like, from a stress standpoint, like, you pull a trigger a couple times. It's just something about it. It's really cathartic. It just mm-hmm. releases a bunch of anxiety and stress. And It's just fun. <laughs> just a burst of, like, pow. You know? Hell yeah. Get that. Send that stress that way. Yeah. <laughs> I've been wondering if I should keep my gun... Cause it's not really a daily carry. It's a, uh, it's a 40 cal. And so, um, it's a good I'm wondering, one. do I keep Should it in you? the house? Do I keep it in the truck? Come bad about not locking my truck for some reason. You know what we should do? Keep that one in the house and get another one for your truck. Yeah. Cause truck ones aren't that expensive. You can get a pretty small one, pretty inexpensive. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Cause I've already had two altercations living here where it's like, man, I really wish I had my gun right now. Like nothing <laughs> diffuses a situation like a gun. I remember I got pulled over at USF. <laughs> of course, you know, on campus, you can't have a gun. Like you get kicked off immediately if you have that back then. So I didn't carry a gun with me in the car. So I had a just a bat in the car, right? <clears throat> and a knife in the uh in the middle and the cop pulls me over and he's like, you have any weapons in here? I was like, just a knife and a bat. And he was like, why do you have those? And I was like, do you know where you patrol? Like, do you know the area? And he was like, good point. <laughs> I was like, why would you ask me that? <laughs> What's also weird too is like the atmosphere 
around guns shifting. It's like so polarizing. And the other day I was at the gas station and I saw a guy that was open carrying. Here in Texas, it's different. Um, it, it definitely feels a little bit more relaxed. But I distinctly remember in Florida when living there, just really fucking tense if someone had a weapon and like a cop. <laughs> Thanks, Leo. <laughs> Was that Leo? Leo jumped up and pressed the button, and then I hit the thing, and then he freaked out when I did it and just fell backwards. It was a nice little scramble off cam. Um, <laughs> but it, it's like if you have a gun, it's like you get interrogated by cops. You know, they're like, why do you have it kind of thing? Just go like, it's like why do what? you have yours? <laughs> yeah, I don't understand that. I think it's probably going to happen less since Florida opened up the – Anyone can carry now in Florida. Yeah, I mean, you don't need a concealed carry anymore, right? It's just no, a constitutional did. right. Constitutional right. That's what they went with. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I like it. Yeah. I mean, you do already have the right to do it. Why not do it? I mean, it does leave it up to each state. And people that I, I don't I don't hate the states that say you need the permit. If that's what they want, if that's what that state wants, that's what they want. All right. Yeah. Like whatever the um, the governor of New York when he instituted the stop and frisk policy because the violence was out of control, like they saw them curve a ton of violence and shootings because of it. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wonder, is it one of those things where like the denser a population gets, the more it kind of makes sense for gun regulation? Because that seems to be where... Um, crazies kind of start to cluster together and you see more weird shit pop off mm -hmm. like in mm -hmm. rural america i don't, I don't you don't know. really seems... ever see that happening well it's because everyone has a gun no one wants right. to mess with anybody because everyone has a gun out there right like you yeah. go in the rural area you don't fuck around with people out there they'll just i'll protect myself and then not only that you protect yourself, and then the, those sheriffs out there understand you protected yourself. And they're going to be like, yeah, we're not going to charge you because we have it on camera. We see what happened. Right. So, like, a lot of the cities, though, you can, you know, almost anyone can have a gun, but then they start banning law-abiding citizens having a gun. But then anyone can get a gun that's not a law-abiding citizen and then use that against the law-abiding citizens to get what they want, and they learn that. So mm -hmm. you take away citizens' protection to be able to protect themselves. I don't know. It's it's a weird thing. Like America, it is a weird thing. It is a <laughs> but you also see the other side of it where they're like, oh well, they need to be regulated. Like okay, it it should be regulated to the point you should have a background check. It should you should I think you should have to go through training before you can get your weapon, right? I don't think you should just be able to walk up and be like, I want a gun, and you get it that day, unless you show you've gone through the training already to yeah. do it. Yeah, but you shouldn't not be allowed to get a gun to be in order to protect yourself as part of the, the constitutional commitment. Once the government starts saying you can't do that, that's literally what the law is protecting you from is from that. That, that was the weird part about my buddy <laughs> getting this rifle that I'd never shot one before. And, uh, him picking up a very, very powerful firearm and all the trust was essentially putting to me to make sure that he is operating this firearm correctly. And, uh, I'll be honest, it, it's almost every single time I put somebody behind a gun. I mean, there's probably four or five people I've taught how to shoot now that it, you're a little nervous that first couple of rounds you're like, Hey, I just want to make sure they don't fucking get trigger happy. So, you know, you put one in the chamber, let them fire that mm -hmm. one off, put one mm -hmm. in the chamber. So you just kind of go through ones cause you don't want someone it kicking back and then they fire a couple off accidentally or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I definitely think like, that's a weird part that I don't understand the pushback. Like if you're going to get a weapon, you should have to go through training because an instructor also would have an additional opportunity to pick up on if someone's not mentally fit. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be a stage you have to go through. Okay. You want to buy a gun. You got to go. It, it could even almost be like different tiers, right? So you know, you have to have a CDL license in order to drive a semi truck, right? You can get a regular license and you got to get the CDL license. Okay. Well you can get your pistol license and then anyone can get a rifle, I think, or like a rifle rifle or a shotgun. Cause the, the it's 
it takes a lot to to shoot those. It's you can't really shoot those off quick or manage them very quickly, right? But in order to oh, or a pistol bolt action rifle is what you're referring bolt to. Bolt action or That's lever or does. lever or lever action. Yeah. One of those. But the the but in order to get like a AR, all right, you're going to have to go through a little training cuz you can just keep hitting those and and all of a sudden lose control of it pretty quickly. Yeah. Or even a pistol is very easy to move around, right? Or if you're going with it, so you should have to go through the training in order to get that. And then the instructors could be, I mean, what if you had social workers that were also trained, like uh, uh, weapons trainers? And then so they knew how to pick up on things easier in order to do that. Now, the question is, though, does that go against your rights in order to own one? They start saying you can't have one. You're like, but I have a right to be able to own one. Yeah, that, that's totally where the constitutional part of it comes in. And I, I see both sides of the aisle, but it, it is undeniable how much the, the shootings are going up every single yeah. year. Because I, I don't Wild. think these people that try to go against it, I'm like, I don't think you realize how easy it is to get a gun. It's not that hard. Yeah. So the people that you're trying to, like, you're saying, well, if we ban all guns, then no one's going to have guns. Like. Every, people are still going to get guns. Anyone can make a gun. We have 3D printers that can make guns now in people's living rooms. It's mm-hmm. not that hard. Yeah. I, like I said, it's it's one of those, like, it seems like a sticky issue, but I think it shouldn't be. I think it should be a bipartisan issue where it's like, okay, there are practical steps we could at least attempt to make. The other weird part about being kind of a, what is it, a libertarian where mm-hmm. you don't want any of your rights encroached on. You're like, hey, there's already enough uh mm-hmm. litigation in my life enough regulation so yeah. to speak so i understand that point of it too but it's like man something's got to be done also also two two more things on that the other one is if you take away guns it's not like people aren't going to do bad things you have like china and and england that have been pretty against guns people still stab each other pretty fr- like to the point they're literally trying to outlaw like big knives <laughs> like that's yeah, that's how crazy. Like, at what point do you just say like you need to protect yourself with something, in order to protect against citizens or, or bad people out there with something? And then the other por- portion is, is that uh, you know all these guns that are being sold legally, and you're able to buy a lot of your ammo legally, that goes back into conservation. That's the biggest conservation. Uh, that is the biggest funding for conservation in America it comes from the sale of guns and ammo and hunting equipment, any hunting equipment, clothes, whatever goes back into funding the conservation, protecting our national parks and protecting wildlife. That is the biggest funding. And all these people want to try to go against that and say like, Oh, we don't need that. Well then what are you going to start funding in order to protect the wildlife in order to protect everything? Probably not. Probably not. I mean, my buddy that's in the military, we were talking about that yesterday when we got done at the range. We were just having a couple beers, and uh, I was like, how much do you think the Department of Defense spends every year on just fuel, just gas, just to run Mm -hmm. the shit that we have? We looked it up. It was $845 billion is what is spent every year on just fuel. Just fuel. It ain't good. It ain't the bad stuff. It's probably the premium. Oh, yeah, up. he was telling me he was like, he was like, there's no way to track that. I mean, so what we looked it up is the budget is 845 billion, but when they go to fuel up their stuff, they don't they don't track what's uh, you don't log how much gas you're putting in or whatever. Like that's not tracked. It the only thing that's tracked is how much is brought to the gas stations to the pump, yeah. essentially. Past that, they just get a key card, and they're like, yeah, you got a government vehicle. You just gas shit up, you know, gas-free. Just go. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get where you're going, dude. I got to get myself one of those cards. <laughs> yeah. so, how do I it, find that thing? It's one of those things. I mean, because, wow, when I was uh, at a course with Abby recently. There's a brewery here that has a cool disc golf course, so you can, like, get a beer and uh, play disc golf and or just when you're done, go to the brewery or whatever. And that was the first time in, a, I think, probably seven or eight years since I've heard a sonic boom. There was a, a jet came by and broke the sound mm. barrier. 
and uh, we didn't see the jet, but we sure as fuck heard it. And then the boom came through the trees, and you saw all the trees tunnel over. That was wow. Weird. That's cool. Fifty thousand dollars an hour is what it <laughs> cost that aircraft. Fifty thousand dollars an hour. Just get that so- bitch up. 19 year old driving that soccer. <laughs> yeah, dude. The he, big old traditional American Eagle on his arm. He just graduated Air Force Academy and he's like, oh, yeah, baby. What a rip. Taking it out on a joyride, doing a little low, uh, low fly <laughs> buzz action. Yeah. <laughs> I always wanted to be a pilot. That, that was a short live. I Everyone know. wants to be a pilot. <laughs> I know. If you're going to do something, no one's like, I want to be the the guy that brings them food. I want to be the, the street sweeper or the ship cleaner. It's all part about making this beautiful war machine move, though, isn't it? That's a beautiful war machine. <laughs> <laughs> you got to keep them cogs lubricated and going, baby. I, I love how a lot of people will be against, you know. We do have our, our military industrial complex is huge, and we do a, do a lot of stupid shit that we shouldn't be doing. But also we do a lot of cool shit where you can do a lot of neat things here without <laughs> having to worry about other people coming after you and other people coming to the country doing things to you. Well, speaking of, the apparently the Ukrainian counteroffensive is kicked off as of today. It's officially in motion. What is that? Have you been following the war with Russia and Ukraine at all? No. I, I, I stopped really? following up on it. It was kind of the same thing back and forth over time. Yeah, I think it's just... a. Uh, really interesting kind of case study of war in the uh, the 21st century, but not even it's, you know, it's like you're watching, like it pops up on my feed all the time. You're watching GoPro footage of uh, war. I mean, what, which that's always kind of been present. I guess the thing that hasn't been is the drone footage. Mm-hmm. So they're showing like Russian soldiers in trenches and some of these drones don't even have grenades. Like they've already done, a drop trying to kill soldiers and now they're just doing kind of like recon missions and they'll fuck with the Russian soldiers. They'll make them think that they have a bomb. And so some of these guys, I mean, I can't imagine the PTSD if one of these soldiers was able to make it back home and there they were in a trench in a war that they most certainly did not want part of. And Mm -hmm. they were conscripted to go fight. They were drafted. Can you just imagine? It's like a video game. It's like something out of a black mirror a drone coming down and buzzing you and you think it has a grenade and it just does this. You're just like, oh shit. A dozen shit. times over. You're like, this is it. Yeah. I'm going to die. And it just keeps going and going and then just flies off. And then another one comes back with a grenade and like, maybe that's the one, right? Maybe they miss. Yeah. Maybe they don't. Like, oh dude, war is terrifying. I just, mm. I can't imagine. One side you have people that are like, man, just leave us the fuck alone. All we want is our freedom. We just, we just don't want you guys here. Like, that's it. The other side's mm-hmm. like, we don't want to be here, but this dude's making us be here. Otherwise mm-hmm. we get imprisoned or killed or whatever. We're killed either way. We're either here fighting and live or we go back and then we're killed. We're going back. So it's just, I've been following it just cause it's so interesting. Um, because I didn't really think about it until watching this development but for most wars, we're sending over young young men, 18, mm-hmm. 19, 20-year-old men. And those are really the men that have typically defended and, uh, and, and done the dirty work of whatever is going on. Mm-hmm. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know, man. It's just trippy. It's tough to wrap your head around. What would the war, the world be like if there wasn't the word war? You know, what, where, where would the world be? You know, just because we have the word war, it people like to use it to go towards that. Oh, we can, we're going towards war. What if we didn't have that? Yeah, I mean, we're going, we're going towards Frank. Damn it! It seems like it's just something a part of human nature: the need to conquer and suppress, oppress, and mm-hmm. just to accumulate resources. Um, but I don't it know. seems like a part of some people's nature and then some people's some nature, people. unfortunately they get into leadership in order to make, they want to make that happen. Yeah. I don't think that's a lot of people, but occasionally someone like that gets into leadership and then they, they're like, all right, I'm going to rally all these people to get what I want out of this situation. 
And it's that over there. I remember in uh, high school, we did this like case study kind of thing. It was like one of the coolest things. It stuck with me all these years when it, anytime I think about war, our teacher had us read this book and I, I don't remember what the name of the book was. Um, but essentially what she did is as we were going through the book, each chapter, mm-hmm. we would, the class would decide what it, it was basically replaying what went down in Germany and you would decide what party you wanted to associate yourself with. And you didn't know this is what it was replaying the events in Germany. So you're reading this propaganda in the book and it's got this really cool plot and the way it plays it out. And at the end, you realize this whole time you've been feeding into something that you didn't sign up for because that is essentially what Hitler did was like slowly but surely. It wasn't all at one time where they he mm-hmm. radicalized all of those people. It was just like, no, we all feel this way, right? Like that was wrong. So it's just like these pinpricks mm-hmm. of momentum towards an ideal until suddenly everyone looked around and was like, how the fuck did we get here? Mm-hmm. And, and most of those people had no idea what was going on. You know, they were just radicalized. And I mean, that's politics in a nutshell, right? Like that's the danger of divisive politics is that most people get riled up about an ideal and like law. You're like, if you break the law, you don't feel the consequence when you break the law, not even when you get caught. It's only until you're in prison that you're like, oh, fuck. Those words led to this. Mm -hmm. Right. Some words on a document. And now I have other people that are like, no, we're abiding to those words on that document, which means you got to go here. And then there's not shit you can do about it. Man, imagine those people, too, that thought they were following the law. Right. They're like, yeah, this is the law. We follow this. And then it turns out on the world scale, that was completely the opposite law. They yeah. fall in. They're like, but doing propaganda, this wrong the whole time. Right? That's what it's all about. It's just uh, maneuvering information. Mm-hmm. shelling off populations to certain pieces of information that don't fit the agenda of whatever. Or you go like uh, that. What was that uh, show on Netflix? Wild Wild Country with the Mm -hmm. cult that started and then they were creating their own rules and their own laws within it. But then it was against what America was wanting them to do. That show is amazing. That is an amazing show. That that's a, if you've never watched it, folks go watch wild, wild country. You, you get to watch the beginning all the way to the end and kind of still there. Colt still a little bit around. Oh, it's, it's still kicking a little bit. I remember asking my parents, I was <laughs> like, cause when you're going through it, you're like, how have I never heard of this before? And I asked my parents yeah. and I'm like, did you, did you guys know about this? And none of, none of my parents had heard about it, but it was all over the national news. I mean, when that was going down, that was like a really, really big deal. And not that long ago either. Right. It was like in the nineties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it was late eighties, early nineties. It was going on not long ago. Yeah. I mean, the cult does sound pretty cool, though. We could start it was kind of interesting that in order for them to gain votes, they were getting uh, a lot of uh, illegal immigrants or homeless people to come in to mm-hmm. the town so they could gain votes. And I was like, that seems familiar. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a playbook there. Whatever works, man. <laughs> Whatever works. You know, it's just about a... Uh, Finding, finding that groove, baby, finding the people that support your thinking. And that whole cult was all, I mean, all cults are kind of typically based around what, like peace, love, happiness, and Mm -hmm. utopia. And they're just like, hey, we all want to be free. And the leader's like, I want some Rolls Royces, actually. Rolexes are pretty cool, too. And uh, your wife is hot. We got to tax a little bit. We got to fund, you know, a little bit of the stuff around here. We need you to go work. Yeah, they're all like, hey, we don't we don't need things. He was like, no, you don't need things. You don't need things. I need things. I'm your leader, and it's kind of hard for me to picture my life without things, you know? Like, I'm leading, yeah. so I need things. I have to lead you. You got to protect me. I got to be comfortable so I can make the right decisions for Sign you. Sign here, initial here. Your child can go over there. And then... Um, <laughs> <laughs> is your child... Is he... At work, he works well, young, energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Energy. 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 We need new houses built. We're going to send them. 
We got some new recruits coming in. We're going to teach them how to swing and hammer. It's going to be good for them. It's going to be good for them. It's good experience. Good experience. <laughs> you, though, you, though, know how to make good spaghetti. Hey, go baby. Here. Oh, we got a great <laughs> kitchen for you. <laughs> well, coming from 2023 uh, professional hippies cult. Be sure to check the show notes for an official application, and we'll keep yes. you up to speed. Join the cult, the professional hippies. <laughs> We're coming right at you. We got Mike Tyson here. He's ready. He's right in. Got him. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> got him. <laughs> Signature and all, ready to go. <laughs> I think we found a nice zone to... Bring this, bring this in, bring this home. Let's, I think this let's is lay in that sonic boom F-16. Let's bring yeah. her down. Well, folks, if you don't want to be a part of Cole, <laughs> hey, we totally understand. But if you've made it this far into the episode, um, leaving a review is super helpful. It helps us stay on your algorithm and on the algorithms of others. Mm-hmm. So send us someone you love, send them someone you know, maybe someone you don't love. That's okay, too. We love them. That's okay. the you don't same. like us, send them the ones you don't like. They'll probably right. like us. Till next week. Hey, next week we have an awesome guest for you guys. Mm. He, if you're mm. into music, you'll really dig him. Mm. He comes from uh, brand management, music management, and uh, we'll in- give him an official introduction next week. But we love you guys. Peace. Peace.